Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Future Left Podcast. I'm Casey Rogers. With me, as always, is my good buddy, Adam Simpson. How are you doing today, Adam? Doing pretty good. Fantastic. Future Left is a podcast and a blog where we focus on building and defining a progressive future. Today, we're joined by Phil Torres, founder and director of the uh, X Risk Institute. He's an affiliate scholar with IEET. He's worked uh, with Ray Kurzweil. He's the author of The End, What Science and Religion Tell Us About the Apocalypse. You can check him out on riskandreligion.org. And uh, Phil, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Great. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, we're, we're really glad to have you. I just I just wanted to add that you can you can find the S Risk Institute at xriskinstitute.com, just just in case you're looking to find that. But um, yeah, uh, I do I do feel like I have to mention um, it's been a dark week, and we're talking about the end of the world at the end of this dark week. So uh, <laughs> I guess that's your trigger warning that if you're if you're in a sullen mood, I, I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion. But we are talking about uh, existential risk, which, uh, Phil, uh, I, I, I think our first question is really, um, you know, when you're out at a happy hour or at a networking event and you say, I work on existential risk, uh, w- how do people uh, react to that? How do you explain to them what it is you work on you know, existential risk in your own words? Yeah, when I mention it, um, a lot of people are pretty intrigued initially and you know if i'm not interrupted at some point and i I proceed to go into some more detail about what exactly the topic you know covers and the probabilities that have been put out by people like sir martin reese which are quite pessimistic and dismal about the the um prospect of human civilization making it through the, the 21st century uh by the end of the night um i don't know maybe people are uh you know they've heard enough, or they've at that point they've had you know <laughs> one 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 or two more drinks than they normally would have had. But yeah, I mean, I I, I got into the topic because I was you know I grew up in a household where uh, the end of the world was a topic of discussion within a religious context, mm-hmm. and and it, you know spe- speaking of Trump, uh, who of course just became president president elect now. Um, oh really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry to have to break that to you. Yeah. yeah. But Man, I, I've been sort of a media blackout lately, so that's, that's, that's bad to know. Bad to yeah, hear. yeah. Um, you know, he's he's uh so I remember back like when Clinton was was elected and being told that he he might be the Antichrist. Uh I think a survey out from I can't remember twenty eleven or something found that nineteen percent of Americans thought Obama was the Antichrist. So I sort of I sort of grew up in, in that milieu. And, to uh, be fair, he does have like two months left. It's just to, just to... <laughs> well, well. So Phil, I was a, I was a religious studies uh, major in school, and so I thought, boy, he's got so little time to convert everyone to a common religion, and to boy, yeah. he's, he's really got some got some footwork to do. If he's going to be a good antichrist. He hasn't <laughs> yeah. been a good antichrist thus far, Phil. Yeah, I gotta he say, hasn't. And, and the great the great irony is that Trump genuinely seems to fit a lot of the descriptions of the false prophet you know so, so the false prophets that are you know dis- discussed in the prophetic you know re- parts of scripture um i don't know why there aren't more evangelicals and dispensationalists and whatever who who aren't super alarmed about this charismatic you know quite immoral figure yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> rising to the highest echelon of, of because he's saying power. more base things that they that they, they want to hear I, I think i think yeah uh, not not yeah. having to deal with uh you know people of color and and muslims oh god that sounds fantastic to i think to, to yeah what kind people. of antichrist would want to get rid of muslims that's like a that's a good christian thing right yeah <laughs> yeah um, so it's you know yeah so i guess i always kind of had a a penchant for uh, <laughs> it was it was sort of thinking yeah, yeah it was just there was just seed that was sort of buried deep in my brain that, that yeah. that's uh you know a topic worth thinking about discussing and then it was really the early 2000s well there was a 1996 book by john leslie a canadian philosopher that i think kind of founded the field it was this kind of future logical take on end of the world scenarios you know it wasn't shy about considering phenomena related to nanotechnology and, and advanced biotech and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And he also has this really fascinating defense of the doomsday argument, which we could, you know, perhaps we could discuss later. Uh, sure. It's quite a controversial theory. But then really the early 2000s, um, the field, I feel like kind of took off and became a bit more formal with some of Nick Bostrom's early work. Yeah. And I came across it probably mid 
two thousand mid like probably two thousand six or seven. And you know, the, the the ideas are kind of at least superficially similar to the notion of the end of the world within the religious, you know, Christian context, except that existential risk studies is thoroughly scientific you know it's it's based on evidence they value logic and also I, i'd say that the topic is absolutely important because we really do you know every generation has has claimed that they're the last or you know there's some people in every generation who have waved their arms in the round yeah. in the air and, and shouted but i think there's genuinely good evidential scientific reason for thinking that we live in a, a truly unique era with climate change and with all these emerging technologies and stuff so i also think it's it's crucially important topic for you know for people to be aware of and and to to do their best to understand in an effort to devise you know effective strategies you know risk mitigation strategies to ensure that we you know we 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 go on and we realize the, the all the many good things that technology could bring us i think it's also especially important as a field because it's the type of thing that we as human beings don't want to think about and even if it and it almost seems as if our own imminent destruction was looming even closer and closer and closer it seems like we would almost want to ignore it more and more because our, our brains aren't very good at dealing with uh, existential uh annihilation yeah i think that's um, so, absolutely so, so I, correct i think it's good to have it there as a field to keep us sort of sobered and keep us sort of uh looking in directions preventative directions yeah some scholars have pointed out that like there's more money that goes into studying dung beetles than studying existential risks uh, and you know, there are more papers published on on this topic. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's that is genuinely not to minimize. Sure. I mean, the, you know, entomology, entomology is fascinating and wonderful, and, and so on. I agree. On. But it is to say that there seems to be a priority um, confusion here. Yeah. Uh, that you know that it's so that good could, to, could it's have... so good to have a fellow geek on who's talking about how <laughs> how great entomology is. It's just it's so comforting. <laughs> uh... Yeah. Yeah. No. It's you know. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, some other scholars have have mentioned that probably due to the dismality, the the, the gloom and, and doom aspect of existential risk studies, it's probably one reason it hasn't received sure. a lot of sustained focus from scholars over the years. But it really, and I I totally agree that the brain is just, you know, I, I, brains haven't evolved that much since no. we were you know living in the Paleolithic as hunter gatherers and so on. Yeah. Right. At, at which point it's really, you know, myopic thinking is expedient and advantageous yeah. you know and yeah. thinking about your local tribe i mean i fr frankly i think that these these old paleolithic traits i mean a lot of moral progress is about sort of like uh tamping down these tendencies and sure. i feel like the most recent election is a case of that those old tribalistic urges um yeah. that's a very good point. you know yeah sort of uh becoming much more prominent than they have been uh recently yeah, it really seems like these these elements of our society and these ways of thinking that it's that we've sort of been trying to marginalize uh, over the last I'm I'm gonna say century, but I mean it's obviously been way less than that. That uh, you know for you know it seemed like racism was becoming sort of this thing that would happen that people whisper and sort of know is a shameful thing, even if they, but now it seems like it's becoming mainstream again. You know, if it's occupying the most honored seat in the uh, in our in our in our nation, then. Uh, it's it's going to be coming out of the uh, out of the closet, so to speak. I, I guess now there's going to be a lot of lot less unabashed racism. I yeah. Like. Well, I think just We're the last. To see it. Yeah, I mean it's it's been um, you know not quite a week since the election, and uh, you know already I mean there have been so many just this profusion yeah. of instances of yeah. hate right down the road. Uh, you know I'm in North Carolina, right down the road in Durham. Somebody spray painted "Black Lives Don't Matter, Neither Do Your Votes." Uh, which makes you know, sort of national news. CNN had an article about it. Yeah, it's it's really quite, um, you know, I, I think at the core, you know, tr Trump's core support base was sort of the alt right. You yeah. know, Steve Bannon yeah. is his campaign CEO, and one of the major yeah. tenets of the alt right movement is anti globalism. You know, which yeah. which is which is you know has its roots in kind of uh, a tribalistic uh, mode of thinking. Right. So I do want to ask about one paradox because it seems like on the one hand. Uh, I, I I feel like I agree with both premises, but they seem to contradict one another. Um, on the one hand, it's hard for us to accept that, uh, you know, the end of the world is a possibility um, in terms of climate change and of other issues. But on the other hand, there does seem to be this constant, like, our, our, as you said, our generation is the last, this kind of, uh, kind of regular current. And I'm wondering yeah. how that kind of 
levels out at some point. I don't know. Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, there, there's a great chap book chapter in a book called Global Catastrophic Risks. Okay. Uh, and, That's, isn't and it that was, edited by Bostrom, right? It's edited by Bostrom in Milan Cirkovic. I, I okay. think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, and the the chapter is written by James Hughes, who's uh, oh, okay. who's the executive director, uh, I believe, of the IET. Yeah. And it's it's basically on the history uh, of millenarian thought. Um, well, he he uses a, a slightly different terminology, but it's basically just the the he sort of draws out this fascinating fact that we have a you know some kind of weird bias in our thinking, you know, throughout history. <laughs> All these human groups have sort of hoped that the world would end, yeah. and it kind of makes sense because, you know, there are times when life uh, is not all that much fun, <laughs> and you know, and and great injustice, uh, sure. uh, you know, you're faced to, to to you're forced to face great injustice in the world, and the whole notion of the world ending and cosmic justice being exacted on all these evil people, you know, the the bad ones go to hell and and the good ones go to heaven for eternity. There's something obviously really appealing. Sure. There, um, and and also, I mean, a lot of the the harbingers of of the eschaton, the end, mm -hmm. uh, are so vague that they can fit almost any you sure. know any place or, or time. You know, natural disasters and social unrest and things of, of that. You know, wars, rumors of wars, yeah, and so on. And it's kind of um, part of the phenomenon where there there there's a constant cycle of prediction. So whenever someone gets something even slightly right, it's like, see. We win. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, well, I mean, this, the Seventh Day Adventist Church today exists simply because there was a. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm not going to remember his name now, but there, there was James a, Miller. Uh, James Miller, uh, the yeah. Millerites, and uh, they, it, he, 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 he uh, and I, oh my God, I almost don't remember any of the numbers about this. But there was one prediction. <laughs> he said, "This here's the day. I've I've looked at the math and I've added up all the ages of the old uh, the Old Testament prophets and I and I've you know uh, calculate and it is going to end on this day at this time." It didn't happen. He went back to the drawing board, did it again, and it didn't happen again. And everybody was like, all right, we're, we're done with you. And he's like, wait, what is going on? Oh, uh, people need to go to church on Saturday, and then it'll happen. <laughs> so let's start going to church on Saturday so the world can end, everybody. Yeah, I think it was – I don't remember the date, but October and then 1843 and 1844. That's, that sounds right, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's stories – I've not been able to, to vet this claim – uh, myself, but there's a uh, um, Stephen Fry on on the British show QI talked about mm -hmm. th this you know th this episode called the Great Disappointment. Yeah, and, yeah, and how how apparently <laughs> <laughs> disappointment. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was pretty disappointing for, for the people <laughs> that the world didn't. Um, yeah, the people gave away all their belongings. They, I, I mean, I know this is true. Gave away all their belongings and yeah, yeah. left their their wives and so on. And then the, the, the story that's not corroborated but has been mentioned by Stephen Fry was that a guy apparently was on the top of a barn and leapt off at exactly 12 a.m. expecting to be, you know, uh, caught up into the clouds. Uh, so I, I don't know how oh, that story no. ends. I can imagine that uh, he... Why, why would he just sit in an armchair and wait to be called up? I don't... That's, that seems very strange. I, I guess is a sign of just how much he believed. Well, honestly, was, I... I it's true. I think that we can edit this out. Maybe I think that no. uh, the religion of Christianity probably exists because I think I think Jesus was believed in a, in an imminent apocalypse, and when it didn't happen, and when he was killed, I think that the trauma on his followers was such that they were like, "This okay? We do we need to do something? I feel like we need to do something. This can't be <laughs> yeah. the end of it." And I and I feel like almost probably that denial that it didn't happen the way he said it was going to happen probably is the reason yeah. that we still have Christianity existing today. My, my sense is that. Uh, the overwhelming majority of New Testament scholars in North America and Europe believe uh, have have adopted Albert Schweitzer's notion that Jesus was this failed apocalyptic prophet. Yes, yes, and, I think so too. Well, know, I think he was certainly... also I think he was also a political activist as well. I think he was also fighting against the Roman occupation and stuff like that. Yeah, it's also worth mentioning in terms of like uh, with respect to Millerites and and great disappointments. You know, the the term cognitive dissonance was coined <laughs> by. Do, are you familiar with the story? I'm not, it's, it's, I'm not. Oh, so no, the origins coined, of the term? The origins of the term by Leon Festinger, I, I think I'm saying his name right, um, who mm -hmm. infiltrated a 1950s doomsday UF, UFO cult. And, um, you know, they believed there was going to be this great earthquake that was going to, like, destroy uh, uh, America. 
and some UFOs. Right. They they called them the boys upstairs. We're going to swoop down, and and uh, you know take up this this uh, cult, thereby saving them from this sure. you know doomsday catastrophe. So he you know he's a, was a sociologist or psychologist I can't remember, but he was with a few other colleagues, and they thought well let's just infiltrate this group, and study them from the inside, at, uh, in particular to see how they respond to to their their prophecies being so obviously yeah uh yeah. disconfirmed by the evidence sure. and they found that you know a lot of the group members weren't that interested in chatting to the media before Absolutely. the event they were they were it's kind of insular and uh they were very internally focused and then the event happened and a few people got got absolutely livid and uh you know stormed out shouting you know you've ruined my life and, and so on but there's a, a larger portion of the group that actually doubled down on their beliefs. And, and they came up with all of these these pretty creative sort of rationalizations, like it was because of the strength of their faith mm. that humanity got saved. So, the, so they actually, there was a way to, to reinterpret the data such that it actually confirms their belief. And suddenly, sure. at that point, they went out and they got in touch with all of these, all the news, local newspapers and so on. So, so they coined the, the, or they, you know, proposed the theory of cognitive dissonance um, in order to explain exactly these sorts of situations. So it's wow. kind of a fascinating, or yeah. you know, prophetic, eschatological origin of, you know, yeah. the notion of cognitive dissonance. No, well, we see it. We see that a lot today. The, yeah, the, uh, unfortunately, it's a lack of cognitive dissonance, right? Whenever people aren't, uh, whenever people uh, sort of ignore, or that's the thing they ignore. They can either ignore it or recognize it. I guess is, is the and people, I always hear yeah. people arguing, uh, making political arguments, and the other people, you're not going to convince anybody, because it almost yeah. seems as if we, such a large portion of our society is immune to cognitive dissonance completely. Yeah. And it's just very There are definitely, definitely studies that have shown um, when hyperpartisan people are exposed to facts on both sides of the political spectrum, sure. they, they also, their they're, um, they're patently false beliefs tend to be reinforced. Right. When, you know, uh, contradictory facts are presented. So, right, sure. yeah, there, there's there's a lot of strange quirks about human psychology that I think, you know, I, I think today in particular uh, have really been accentuated and sort of sort of ossified you know, yeah. in our culture. Like pe people are just so dogmatic. And uh, frankly, I think that it's much more on the right than it is on the left. But um, I don't know how to to. I don't know what the answer is, you know, out of this this labyrinth. So, yeah. No, I, I do want to move on to some other issues about existential risk. But before I do, I just want to I just want to ask, you know, uh, if we we you know, future left, we're supposed to be talking about the future and progressive politics. We do end up dealing with you know, dr especially during the election, uh, an election you know, like this, when we do get up end up drawn into the kind of the politics of the moment and whatever's happening. Um, but you know, I, I get like when you're working on like. Whether it's uh, gray goo or super volcanoes or or what have you, does do, like how does this does this affect your relationship to like you know like a leaked audio from the Trump campaign or or battles of over you know tax cuts or something like uh, how does this inform your kind of relationship to politics? It seems like it would it would it would cause some sort of distance. Are you are you above like everyday politics now? <laughs> because it seems like you're dealing with such. It it seems like when people are like tax cuts, you're like who cares about tax cuts? There's gonna be a, yeah. a meteor crashing into us. And, no. Um. Uh, no, actually, not not so much because I think sometimes those small uh, events are are actually relevant. I mean, I think there are sort of cascading effects that they can have. There's there's um you know Nick Nick Bostrom has argued that the the ultimate uh, moral uh, action is one that re that minimizes the probability of an existential catastrophe, um, and. And then th there's a former um, Future of Humanity Institute scholar named Nick uh, Beckstead who has a really interesting critique of this idea where he, he basically introduces this, this framework according to which you can imagine you know, the future as the future having some kind of trajectory. And rather than, than think only about the, the biggest issues, you need to recognize that there are all sorts of minor tweaks to this trajectory that can have long-term you know effects down the road so i think there's a set so i like this notion of like um 
developmental trajectory change. You know, and and I and because that sort of closes the gap between the highest level, you know, super volcanoes and in Grey Goo and so on, and then this sort of lower level, you know, what's like Ben Carson might be appointed to Secretary of Education. You know, I, I think that, could that seems have, like a big thing to me. <laughs> that seems like a pretty big thing to me, actually. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, it's it's not like direct. It's not like directly obviously related to. He's a doctor who doesn't believe in science. Yeah, and it's not directly obviously related to existential risk, but sure. um, but it, it it is, I think, very much indirectly related. You know, perhaps the next generation, which is really going to be struggling with climate change and, yeah. and stuff like this. I mean, they need to be educated and have the tools of of careful, you know, precise scientific yeah. thinking, um, yeah, you need to have those, those cognitive tools in order to, uh, to make wise, prudent, good, yeah. <laughs> safe decisions. And they need to right. not believe that pyramids were for storing grain is also what they, 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 they yeah. there, there's so much, it's one of those things. There's so much evidence that Ben Carson should have no role in education that it, uh, it's one of those things that I want to throw my hands. If up I was the... going under the knife and as, and as I was succumbing <laughs> to uh, the anesthesia, I saw Ben Carson beginning to lead a prayer. Uh, oh, at the, oh uh, I, I think I'd be like, "Oh no! Wait! 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 wait. <laughs> yeah. That's not. I don't want you relying on that." Ben. And then darkness would take you. Um, yes. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I thought was very interesting uh, and and quite jarring, actually, over the next century, um, I, I was reading in. Uh, it was a future of life study, I think, that, that extrapolated over the next century. Humans are more likely to die in an extinction level event than a car crash. Can yeah. you can you explain um ha, uh, can you explain that to our audience just in your own words? Yeah. So, so I, I feel like a good a good springboard, a good point of reference is uh, is the claim that you're, yeah you know, you're more sure. likely to yeah. die from a, from getting hit by lightning than dying in a, a terrorist attack. It's not what um, I heard on Fox News, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. It's, it's. It's not the oh. sense we're given. Yeah. <laughs> that I know. That doesn't feel right. Yeah. If it, the terrorist attack feels so much more immediate, I don't know why, but it it does. Even though I I know intellectually how remote it is, but we hear you just don't hear a lot about uh, meteors on the news. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so so this is the thing. Like, you know, you look back through history. Like, there aren't many cases of people dying from meteor strikes. I think there's maybe one case in like the '80s, something like that. But the idea is that the the uh, the scope of the disaster would be so great that if you look at it from a certain statistical perspective, uh, as scientists tend to do, then you know if if you average it out over the course of a lifetime, uh, the result is that you're more likely to to die in a meteor strike than from you know from a terrorist attack. So so it's it's kind of a similar idea that that leads to the claim that you just mentioned. As it happens that that. It was a Global Challenges Foundation uh, report, and they they did amend it later on, in part because they relied on this a stern review figure, which was not an empirical uh, conclusion of theirs. It was just an assumption built into their model. So it was a, it was a, t- a little bit misleading. But what's not what's really important to mention to note is that the stern review estimate was nine point five percent chance of extinction per century. If you actually read a lot of the experts, like I mentioned, Sir Martin Rees earlier. Nick Bostrom, um, who else? John Leslie, various other figures who have actually tried to to have actually estimated the likelihood of some human extinction or civilization ending scenario. The probabilities are much higher than that. You know, Sir Martin Rees says we have fifty percent chance. Uh, civilization has fifty percent chance of making it through the century. Um, there was a survey done by the Future of Humanity Institute from two thousand and eight. And they found, they um, you know a survey of experts and the the average was the result was essentially nineteen percent chance of extinction per century. So I mean it's I mean these probabilities to be clear could absolutely be wrong. There there's a lot of subjective there's a, there's a few objective um, measurements in there like the probability of an asteroid impact or supervolcanic eruption. Supervolcanic eruption you know happens once every fifty thousand years. And a species destroying asteroid impact happens every 500,000 years. So I mean, you, you, there's some objective data, but then with respect to to advanced technologies and things of that nature, yeah. there's a lot of subjective judgment that that you know you you just can't avoid. Sure. So the probabilities could be wrong, but the the other thing to emphasize is that these are these are educated guesses by people who who are pretty level headed 
and really scientifically minded. Mm -hmm. So I, so they're at least they're at least worth taking seriously. And given the the global scope of global spatial scope and you know pan generational temporal scope of an existential catastrophe, you know that's why the probability is you know why why you could say you're you know 19 times more likely to die in a human extinction event than to die in a car crash or something like that. Wow. So. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 a bit it's a bit sobering. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, we, we, as mentioned before, we evolved in the Paleolithic, yeah, uh, and we never encountered risks of this sort at all. You could always sort of peer, you know, retrospect, look over your shoulder, and and uh, and learn from your mistakes. With with existential sure. catastrophes, you can't. I mean, there's with yeah. an extinction event, we could talk about them happening tomorrow, but not one having happened yesterday. Um, so they're, they're really, you know, there's an availability bias where we tend to think more probable events are ones that we can easily recall. That's certainly the case with terrorism. That's one reason people are so freaked out by terrorism. Sure. Um, you know, it's all over the media and, and you know, all over Fox News all the time. Hmm. So uh, you, you can't recall an ex, you know, civilization collapse right. uh, in our past. So we, we tend to, to automatically think the probability is lower. But actually, really, if you, if you look carefully and if you listen to the experts, the probability is probably higher than a lot of other risks, mundane risks we worry about all the time. Sure. And it's also weird at how we, we hear about terrorism and terrorist strikes in the U.S. being imminent. We, we, we hear about that so much more than we hear about them having happened that I, th I think we always assume that they're happening all the time because we're always hearing about them. But we're always hearing about them in, in the in the future sense, like, oh, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't know what that was. That's probably nothing. <laughs> what I said. Uh, well, no, I, I think that's right. And, and you know, my biggest—it's always concern, looming. Yeah, there, there's. I mean, I think that's part of a strategic narrative, in order to um, right. to prop up certain, you know, probably political apparatuses and belief systems sure. and whatnot. Right. Um, but I mean, my my biggest concern about terrorism is really the future of terrorism. Yes. Uh, I feel like the Islamic State. You know, that was an apocalyptic group that essentially. Sure believed it needed to destroy the world to save it yeah and you know there's one study that's that's tied it uh to um there, there are many many scholars who believe it, it if it weren't for the the syrian civil war that started in 2011 then you wouldn't have had the islamic state and there was actually a, a study in proceedings of the national academy of sciences that connected anthropogenic climate change with the syrian yeah. civil war and they provide quite a good case for that so i mean it's it's just one extra step to say you know climate change has fueled apocalyptic terrorism and that is also a connection that other apocalyptic terrorist scholars have talked about and published about so as climate change gets worse as uh you know perhaps as as the u.s uh engages in various uh misguided foreign policy uh yeah uh endeavors yeah like syria the syrian refugee syrian uh, rebels right now are like pleading for U.S. help, and now the U.S. is kind of aligned with Syria and Russia and Iran. You know, they're all allies. It's, so, I mean, th this this might just fuel um, conflict, and and that's the primary reason why I'm worried about terrorism, in particular, the most dangerous form of apocalyptic terrorism uh, in the future. Not because I think we're going to die yeah. tomorrow. Right. I, I'm more worried about lightning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. To be fair, when I say like extinction level, more l greater chance than car can car crash, still wear your safety belts. Obviously, we're not <laughs> we're not saying anything like that. No, but um, so my background is actually on uh, Middle East studies, and it's it's oh, okay, great. It, it's difficult to to talk to people about like you know the anth anthropogenic causes of the Syrian civil war because um. It's because at the end of the day, people don't rise up in a country because like because the weather patterns have changed and people have uh, like if you ask a, a, a rebel like I, he's not going to say I'm here because climate change forced me to come to the city where there's more inequality, where I, <laughs> I had more complaints with the government. It's it, it's all political reasons. And there's people are kind of resistant to make those leaps, I find, um, un unfortunately. I think it requires a bit of scholarly precision and insight yeah. to, to, to make those connections, because you're absolutely right. I mean, so one of the things that, that apocalyptic terrorism scholars have talked about is the, is the connection between the emergence and the, the formation of apocalyptic ideologies as a result of external environmental factors of instability and you know political unrest and, and things of that nature. So, um, 
yeah, so I mean, you know, if you talk to some of the terrorists, they'll point to, if you talk to Islamic State, for example, they will absolutely point to their religion. You know, it's, it's, we can see that the, all these, these prophecies are being fulfilled. One of the, the second leader, um, uh, Al Masri of the Islamic State, you know, believed that the Mahdi, the, the, uh, Islamic end of days messianic figure was about to appear and he made all these, these really bad strategic decisions that totally backfired <laughs> based on this, this belief. But if you trace it back to like, well, why did they, how did they come to adopt this ideology that as uh, people like Wilma Kantz have, have talked about, he's a guy at the Brookings Institute, yep. um, you know, apocalyptic thinking really was not all that widespread in the Middle East right. before 2003. Yeah. And it was the Iraq war that, it, that, you know, b- brought this, everybody kind of looked around and, and thought like, oh, maybe the end of the world, yeah. <laughs> you know, is upon Absolutely. us, and maybe the U.S. is the Byzantine uh, army that was was discussed in Islamic uh, prophecy. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, ap- apocalyptic fervor always seems, even in American history, it always seems to uh, explode and, and thrive during times of war, uh, during times of, of scarcity. Like, I mean, look at look at the Millerites. I mean, that's that's. So... I mean, historically, times of social reorganization and cultural transformation. That, those are the fertilizer right, right, right. Of, of the of extreme beliefs, the rise of demagogues. We can see that right now. We, we, so we, you know, retrospecting a bit, we could see that happen in the Middle East with the 2003 Iraq War, right. and then subsequently the Syrian Civil War, which some commentators have described as, as maybe the beginning of World War III, given all of the international, you know, mm. influences there. And then I think we can also see it in the wake of, in the wake of the Iraq War in the U.S. And then the Great Recession, when a lot of white people, uh, yeah. you know, suffered the consequences of their previous yeah. vote for George Bush, but you know, aren't clever enough to to identify the the causal chain, yeah, and, sure, and the, the etiology of, of the Great uh, Recession. So then you get someone like like Trump. I mean, it's this is not a surprise to scholars to people who study this issue. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. every, all the ingredients were there for a Trump like figure to rise up well what's yeah, interesting right. about this causal chain is that as someone who works on the middle east i i i feel like constantly i've told people like i you know obviously um islamist extremist ideology is a factor but when i think about uh terrorism and the drivers of it i think about uh, authoritarianism i think about poverty i think about um education levels there are so many different factors that drive a phenomenon but um at the end of the day the pushback i get is like you know no one from ISIS is saying it, like they say they're they're happy to tell you it's because of their religion that they're doing this, and th- that it almost becomes kind of a um, an Orientalist thing that I'm ascribing to them. You know, other phenomenon beyond just taking them at their word is often an argument I get when I try to um, I-, I guess go deeper into someone's motivations. Uh, well, I, I'm I find that I'm often I'm often reluctant to say that it's because of religion as well because anytime there are other factors you know be them in, environmental or, or political uh, religious communities are going to frame them in the context of 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 religion because it's the most literally the most powerful framing structure they have. Yeah, I, I think the, the big problem here is a resistance to nuance. Yeah, and that th- there is a multiplicity of different yeah. causes and. Um, I certainly think it's important to listen to what to what people you know the the, the terrorists or the extremists themselves say. But I sure. um, and also the other thing I would I would very much point out is if you do listen to them, they don't just talk about religion. Yeah. I mean the, the Islamic State has you know lectures on the Sykes Pico Agreement, <laughs> you know, and the Balfour right. Agreement, and all of these historical um, d- documents or you know, treaties or whatever that um th- that they are still you know it's sort of like you know hashtag never forget <laughs> you know <laughs> exactly I mean, the, yep. a lot of these people have really embodied that very uh attitude and over the you know course of many many decades still remember um the sykes pico so i mean there absolutely are you know bin laden was was really angry about all of the iraqi children who died as a result of u.s sanctions right he was really he was really up- livid about um, U.S. military presence in Saudi Arabia, yeah, you know the the, the holy, holy lands, yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, it's also absolutely true. I mean, I, I like to point out to people who say, well, you know, they, uh, you know, they're they're singing, they're, they're shouting Allahu Akbar, you know, as they as they run into the the Badakhlaw 
theater. Yeah, right. yeah but, but literally, if look it up online, they literally also said this is for Syria. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, they're, I feel like the terrorists themselves are, have always been clear that there is religio-political yeah. elements. Uh, and then I think if you dig deeper, um, you will find that there are, oh, there are other connections, like maybe climate change sure. is yeah. fueling instability, and the instability fuels these, right. these extremist ideologies. So... Yeah, I think I, I think there's a there's a degree of nuance yeah. that's required to 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 get a complete causal picture. Well, well, nuance of nuance is on. a nuance is a dirty word today in our in our discourse, discourse still. So I know it is. I'm trying to bring nuance back. <laughs> um, you know, that's, you know that's not as catchy as bringing sexy back, but I, I think it's. I know. Better. I was going to say to quote Justin Timberlake. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to bring well, I'm I, bringing nuance back. <laughs> I want to move on to kind of the the existential the meat of the existential risk stuff. Um, so um, one, one argument that I thought was particularly interesting. So you talk about existential risk and then also some of your own work, you talk about agential risk being a bigger, like perhaps even a more important factor than just, is it gray goo? Is it this? Is it that? Stuff like that. You, you talk about the agency of the individual involved. And I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on that for us. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, so the, the fo- so I would describe existential risk studies um, as well, okay. So I'm I'm thinking through the the details here. Sure. Like John Leslie did talk about various agents in his 1996 book, but really since the early 2000s, um, with Nick Bostrom, the future of, of Humanity Institute, there's been a, it's the field has been really technocentric, and mm. there's something that I would describe as like a hardware bias. You know, super intelligence is an agent, right? It has agential status. It has it's sure. makes its own decisions uh, by definition. You, you know, in order to to acquire various means to achieve its ends. So, um, you know, but, but that's, that's, that's received quite a bit of attention from, from scholars recently, but, but it's not the only agent out there. I mean, there are, there are terrorists, there are other sorts of malicious um, uh, actors who are really completely ignored and, and really ought to, be, ought to be studied because it offers another way to mitigate risk. Because you could intervene then not just on the technology, mm-hmm. not just not just put in like safety measures to keep nanotechnology from being abused, but to uh, to intervene on the agent in order to prevent him or her from using that technology for harmful ends. So as I've written before, like the risk potential of, of these technologies can only be realized with a complete agent tool coupling. That kind of makes sense. Right. Um, but so then there's a further question: What is the nature of these agents? And the answer to that, I think, is way more complicated than a lot of people have assumed. So oftentimes in the existential risk literature, you hear people uh, referencing like, oh, some malicious individual, um, you know, a doomsday cult, uh, nutcase, you know, yeah. th- things of that sort. They're really just vague references. Um, no, no further comments are made about the, the properties that are unique to these different kinds of agential risks. So... Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to sort of fill in this this lacuna in the, the literature and focus on, you know, like, so as a thought experiment, if you had a doomsday button in front of you, if everybody in the world did, who would push it? You know, would Donald Trump? Like, like I don't know, maybe, maybe because he's, he's crazy, <laughs> but probably not, because I think he also cares about self-preservation <laughs> sure. a lot, yeah. and, and it's hard to self-aggrandize. Yeah. If, if nobody exists. If he had a sure, really you know. bad day on Twitter, he might consider it. But uh, beyond that, yeah. Right. Exactly. Phil, yeah. He's Phil, su- this, this reminds me a lot, and I, and I, and I hate to interrupt, but I, I, will, I will forget. And, and I, I, I think this is funny because of how anecdotal this is. But I always have this thought. Me and Adam constantly have arguments about how um, we read about this. Uh, Adam sent me this article about this store that they're opening. And was it Norway, Adam? That, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, there's no workers there. Uh, I've heard about this. Yeah. And, and I said that wouldn't work in America because the windows would just be busted out because people, and Adam goes, I don't think America's like that. And I said, Adam, if you had a stadium full of people and someone said, if everyone is quiet, completely silent for 30 seconds, you'll all, each person will get a million dollars immediately. As soon as the time started, <laughs> at least one person, probably more would go Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> and, and ruin it for everybody. And it's like just that chaotic, but I feel like in Norway, I feel like everybody would be like, I, I don't know what it is about America. I don't know. It's just I don't know. There's too much chaos. So, I, I everyone know. should have a doomsday button except Americans. I think we can all agree now. Exactly. That, that yeah. Would, yeah. Because so, Americans yeah, would I mean, push the button and go. Bleh. Yeah. 
Yeah, may, okay, so maybe Americans would be a category. Um, that, that's, that's your, you, you know, you yes. should write a paper on that. Yes, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's like, it's not, I mean, there are a whole lot of terrorists, like brutal, awful, violent individuals sure. who would who would never press the button. Yeah, yeah. Right, because they, cause they have, you know, for example, like political goals. And, you know, the, the Irish Republican army, you know, they're not going to, if they destroy the world, that no. is going to impede their <laughs> yeah. goal of getting Northern Ireland <laughs> yeah, back. Absolutely. Um, same with Al Qaeda, and and less so with the Islamic State. I mean, if the whole world, I mean, they, they you know, part of the the eschatological narrative is is widespread destruction and you know th- things of that nature. So perhaps perhaps apocalyptic terrorists might be on the list. Yeah, um, I think that makes sense. You know, eco terrorists might be another example you know mm-hmm. if as climate change gets worse and worse some, some terrorist scholars have suggested that ecoterrorism will emerge as a as a increasingly significant threat to human survival and it's it's it doesn't take a lot of it's it's not a complicated sort of logical argument that leads to humans must go extinct you know we're ruining yeah. the biosphere yeah. uh, there was yeah. a study out in 2014 that found that 52 percent of wild vertebrates uh the population of wild vertebrates declined by 52 percent between uh, 1970 and 2010. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, we're in the sixth mass extinction event. So, I mean, there's, uh, my, my own conclusion is not that, uh, humanity should be annihilated, Yet. but rather that we should ameliorate <laughs> our, our, our ways, change our lifestyles and so on to make it more sustainable. Yeah. But other people are, you know, people who are biocentrists and, and, uh, you know, and, and have, a certain kind of empathy for yeah. well, uh, for the environment could very well tr- try to, to use nanotechnology, for example, to selectively destroy all Homo sapiens, leaving the rest yeah. of the biosphere more or less intact. And I, was, I, was I, saying, I don't like that as a human. I don't like yeah. that. Well, <laughs> yeah. well I, I want to say, like, even though I obviously think humans are pretty neat and I wouldn't want humans to go extinct, I do get the <laughs> argument that like life in the universe, so far as we know, is very unique. And the no- and the notion that humans pose a threat to all of the life that we know of, is all of the life is, is something to take seriously. Um, now that that doesn't mean that we should gray go go full gray goo and just uh, annihilate all the yeah. pollute all, all of the humans. But I mean, uh, <laughs> well, because also my problem with that is I feel like most human beings don't see themselves as. I feel like a, a human beings should have at least have the op- we should at least have the chance to be convinced that we're a danger to all life. And, and then perhaps annihilate us all. But yeah, right now, yeah. I feel like most human beings aren't going around like, "Yeah, fuck all these species." Yeah, I don't care. But I'm all the human. same, we're losing Humans number one. But all the same, we're losing biodiversity. Yeah, sure. at that doesn't change the facts. Rate. That doesn't change the numbers. And, and that's what, when I was reading uh, one of your one of your papers. I think it was the one in Motherboard with uh, Peter Bogosian. I think, I believe it was. Uh, uh, the when you talked about eco terrorism, I was like, yeah, like uh, you know, I because I I feel like as things get more severe yeah it's 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 one of those things that seems so predictable that there will be people that are like you know what we have to we have to act to protect the broader ecosystem rather than ourselves it, it yeah. seems like something yeah it does seem somewhat of a natural conclusion i think that people will come to some people yeah i i, I don't disagree P- part of the reason this this uh agential risk in particular is is kind of is is tricky is because unlike apocalyptic terrorists you know whose whose worldview is based on faith in revelations that were privately revealed to these ancient prophets. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in other words, beliefs that that at least from a, a certain epistemological perspective are irrational. Some of the premises of the eco terrorist argument are really scientifically robust. So it's it's kind of hard. You know, you can't argue with them about humanity's influence on the biosphere or the climate. Uh, okay, I, I <laughs> you're right about all, all that. There's there's just this other like moral yeah. element, this moral premise that that um, you know that that is is the crucial uh, premise that determines what sort of conclusion whether or not you're going to use yeah. you know synthetic biology to create this uh, designer pathogen to wipe humanity out, or you're going to say we need to immediately implement you know c- carbon taxes and and uh, all sorts of regulations yeah. to to prevent further just you know a ruination of, of the global ecosystems right so it is kind of hard it's the exact same thing with i mean another another t- type of risk which is really interesting is sort of non-obvious and, and in fact this this further emphasizes why the notion of agential risk is important because outside of the context of existential risk this type of person is 
not a worry at all. But suddenly you, you import this type into the, that context and they become a, a huge issue. And that type is um, negative utilitarians. Yeah. Uh, so these are, yeah, these are people who believe that the ultimate goal of moral conduct is to eliminate all suffering. So it follows that, that uh, I mean, there are different versions of it that don't lead to this, this outcome. It's very, it's, that, that, that's always very sci-fi to me, that way of looking yeah. at it, where it's like we, it's, it reminds me of the Borg in Star Trek, where we need to, you're yeah. too chaotic, we need to assimilate you and, and make you part of us because you're, you're not working in your own best interest, or it's like the, the Reapers from the Mass Effect franchise, Mass Effect the video game franchise where they have to destroy they have to destroy all organic life because organic life makes chaos i'm sorry just oh no that's that's really interesting no that that is it's similar because yeah i mean it seems like throwing the baby out with the bathwater a little bit i because my 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 interest in preservation of the environment is a little homocentric because i'm a human being i want human beings to be able to survive and be here so killing human being doesn't seem to uh solve the the main problem in, in my eyes because yeah, a homocentric. Well, I, so like... I think, I think that sort of centrism is um, is is really relevant to to the issue of eco-terrorism, right? And I think with yeah. negative utilitarians, their idea is that it's it's not so much about whether you know humans are focused or not. the The idea is that suffering is bad. So classical utilitarians tend to believe that suffering is bad and pleasure yeah. is good. Uh, minimize suffering and maximize pleasure. Um, so you know, the negative utilitarian says no, it's not really about. Uh, about maximizing pleasures, um, it, it's it's it all comes down to eliminating suffering. So you know, once you've eliminated suffering in the world, your moral duties uh, are are discharged, and you know you've you've done everything you need to do. So it it follows that you know if you were to uh, to destroy all sentient life, I mean you, that would be the greatest moral good uh, possible. You would eliminate suffering from the universe. The, a universe. <laughs> With no suffering, um, because our species has been destroyed, is a better universe. So I mean, there, there are people, there are people out there who genuinely believe this. And again, it's not like um, it, it's not a result of a failure of empathy or other moral dispositions, as in the case of like you, you know apocalyptic terrorists or like school shooter type people who just want to kill as many people before they die. It's it's much more complicated because these these individuals um, have a thought out moral theory, and you know. And you can't just um, you can't just uh, attempt to, as sort of implied a moment ago, just instill more empathy in these individuals. That might actually make their their world destroying tendencies even stronger. So yeah, so this is the idea with with agential risks is is studying like you know who exactly would push the the doomsday button um, if they had it in front of them. I don't think Kim Jong Un would. You know, I think he, he, that's not, that is not conducive to world domination, right. you know, destroying civilization. So it's another reason for why Israel or Iran isn't going to, uh, isn't going to bomb uh, Israel because then they'd suffer themselves the nuclear fallout and, and they'd have the people around them trying to get them. That's, I know Adam's always made that argument that when people say Iran is an existential threat to Israel, Adam's always like, well, that would, they'd, hurt, they'd be hurting themselves and Iran doesn't want to do that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's a good point. And I'm frankly, I'm a little confused about Iran. I, I, I know the Ayatollah uh, Khamenei said not that long ago that, I mean, maybe eight months ago that Israel will no longer exist in 25 years. Um, so I mean, there, there's been a lot of like. I feel like really they probably dead... said that 25 years ago is the problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's the question. To to what extent is this is this mere? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a rhetorical uh, flourish or you know, yeah. just a, a verbal threat. Because I completely agree. I mean, it would be, you know, there were there were terrorists who were upset with Bin Laden because, um, you know, he did something so catastrophic that it, you know, they could have anticipated there's going to be this this massive yeah. uh, a retaliatory. It made response. all the other sure. terrorists look bad. Is the problem? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and terrorists, <laughs> no. if they care about one thing more than anything else, it's their reputation. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I do. I do want to move on a little bit from uh, agential risk. Sure. Um, uh, mm-hmm. We're we're running out of time a little bit, but I, like I, I do want to kind of turn back to the future of terrorism and what you think that looks like. So, 
Um, and, and I think there was an article for you were writing for the Future of Life Institute and uh, you, you, about climate change, actually. But you, you, you mentioned that malicious agents of the future will have bulldozers rather than shovels to dig mass graves for their enemies. And uh, you kind of I'll, I'll let you put it in your wor- own words, but it seemed to be a problem of diffusion of technology and the power to inflict great harm. And I, I, I was hoping you'd elaborate on that and what and kind of the um, the methods that might occur, I guess. Yeah, so I, that's exactly right. There are there are some types of technology, uh, most notably biotechnology, synthetic biology, and nanotechnology, that are not only becoming by by many accounts exponentially more powerful, uh, thereby enabling us to to you know manipulate and rearrange the physical world in all sorts of different ways, good ways, potentially as well as catastrophic yeah. ways. Um, but in addition, a lot of these technologies are becoming much more and more accessible over time. So, you know, whereas like with nuclear weapons, you know, there are, I can't remember, I think there are nine nuclear states, something very close to that. Um, and, and those are those are governmental, you know, entities. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, there aren't many actors in, in the world who have control of nuclear weapons. Um, nuclear terrorism kind of enters in the picture here, but we'll bracket that for now. But, you know, with the, the case with these, um, these emerging technologies that are more powerful and more accessible, the result is that there's this huge uh, multiplication of the number of agents who groups or individuals who could use these for malicious ends. So that you know, automatically increases the probability that somebody is is going to misbehave mm-hmm. and use it for harmful ends. So that's that's part of the the I think it's part of the reason why a lot of existential risk scholars think that emerging technologies pose the greatest by far the greatest threat to humanity. Like we're probably not going to go extinct because of climate change. That could happen. There could be some runaway uh, greenhouse effect, but that's not, uh, I don't think that's probable. I think if you ask most climatologists, you know, on the other hand though, and and you'd say the same thing with asteroids. I mentioned they're, you know, they're not all that common, but you know, with technology suddenly, you know, as I've written elsewhere as well, you know, we're like kids, pyromaniacal kids who, whose matches have suddenly been replaced with flamethrowers yeah. that could burn down the whole global village. So, I mean, we're, we're still the irresponsible kids that we were from the, from the Paleolithic. And suddenly we have all this power. Not only do we, in some big sense, have all this power, but more and more individuals will be getting this power in the future. Um, so, that, so that's, that's really quite like historically unprecedented and historically unique situation to find ourselves in, and one that's, that's very concerning with respect to the, the future of our species. Hmm. So, well, I, I mean, we've talked about like 3d printers. We, we talked about gun control in the context of 3d printers. And um, it, it, that's what, when I read uh, your, one of your articles, it, that's what it kind of reminded me of. Like if you have a 3d printer that can print out the bubonic plague, uh, then that that's, that's a really decentralized form uh, of, you know, the potential of political violence or of, of apolitical violence for all I know. Um, it, it's, it seems, I mean, that, that, that assumes the existence of, of bio 3d printers in, in the, in the future. And me and Adam were, we've always talked about, um, open access and, and we're, we're big fans of open access, but with, with things like the DNA structure, the genetic structure of the bubonic plague or malaria or something, I don't, I'm not as 100% on open access in regards to those things. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of debate, uh, which is an inconsistency, a lot of debate about the extent to which, uh, that information should be, should be free. Um, I'm, I'm just vaguely remembering Nick Bostrom has a, an article I read a, a while ago on information hazards, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I believe um, I believe confronts this this issue. But without a doubt, I mean, I, I have in my book and in a few papers have linked to the the online publicly available genome to Ebola. You can you could find the, the uh, you know the the, <laughs> geno, geno, um, the the genetic sequence of smallpox as well. So I mean, there, yeah, a lot of this stuff is quite available. The biohacker movement has made laboratory equipment uh, increasingly accessible. That equipment is also becoming increasingly automated. So you need less skills. You need less intelligence. You know, you need less oh money. That, and- I've got all that. <laughs> I've got all that. It's great. <laughs> That's the part that scares me. Less intelligence. Good Lord. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's so, you know, it's it's quite um, concerning as, uh, in terms of uh, 3D printers. You know, right now we have um, printers that use... Uh, uh, additive, uh, in additive manufacturing method, you know, which just melts plastic and then piles yeah. it on top. And I think a few uh, are metal uh, 3D printers, but 
in the future there will be, I mean, almost certainly there will be uh, nano factories, which essentially will be able to build up uh, macro level uh, objects from the, the 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 atomic level. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, and, I feel and like, even yeah. Even go ahead. Right now there are like um, kind of similar projects to get like you know obviously not on an atomic level but to get like just to, i guess to kind of extrapolate it to, under, to better understand it for myself there are like these basically small machines that are almost like ants that that can build little structures and uh that perhaps like a shelter or something like that or or what have you so i get it's it's basically that on a on a atomic level but, but phil's talking about the replicators from star trek yeah, though. that sounds great just building material from the atomic yeah. level so i that's terrifying i think there are two there, there are two um, related issues that are, are worth distinguishing. One is autonomous nanobots. So these would just be, you know, nanoscale, billionth of a meter uh, sized machines that could could ro you know roam freely through the universe, get blown or through uh, across um, the, the planet, could get blown by the wind. Perhaps yeah. you could swallow them. You know, if you need heart surgery, you could just swallow a bunch of little nanobotic surgeons. They go in and they fix your heart valve, whatever, and then you excrete them. So. <laughs> And then on the other hand, there's the nano factory, which is a, you know, a larger object, which would basically you give it a feedstock, which would be a simple molecule. And it would order the atoms in, a to in an atomically precise manner to, to build up from, you know, create one tiny little, little bit. And then that would get pushed to the next uh, stage in the uh, nano factory, which would assemble that together. And ultimately you could build up, like I said, like mac macroscopic uh, Entities like a computer. So one of the best ways to think about that is one of the best ways to understand atomic precision is if you could imagine printing out two computers, right? Because you, you you need a new computer, and you know you don't have twelve hundred dollars to buy a new Mac. So instead, you 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 go out and you spend two dollars on feedstock, and you plug in your your nano factory, you download some instructions, and you know however uh, you know a couple hours later or something, you have a computer. If you were to print out two of these, not only would they look identical in terms of their macroscopic properties, like, you know, it's, it's shiny, it's hard, you know, whatever. But if you were to zoom in, you would find the atoms placed in the exact same position. So it would be atomically right. precise. That's the difference between additive, where there's, you know, there's the, the placement of the atoms is totally random and you're just applying, you know, this right. plastic one on top of it. It, atomically precise manufacturing is different than that. It is really a bottom-up uh, way of wow. manufacturing. So, I mean, on the one hand, that's like that can lead to radical abundance, as Eric Drexler says. Um, you know, you could print out all sorts of, you know, a car. I, I mean, the the cost of printing out it's the difference between it's the difference between printing out a plastic skull and an actual bone human skull. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, exactly. I mean, all of the macro level properties. Um, a hardness, color, you know, um, how, how smooth it is, all of those are reducible to the arrangement of atoms. So it follows sure. that if you can yeah. arrange those atoms in different ways, you can produce all of those different different properties. Sure. So there's extraordinary possibilities for, you know, for all sorts of wonderful things and, you know, creating, uh, a, a, you know, all the surplus at yeah. basically no cost. But on the flip side, you know, you could you could also create an AK-47 or maybe maybe a bomb. Some people yeah. have. I think there's still ongoing debate about the extent to which you could print out uh, an atomic bomb of some sort. Um, yeah. So, so the. I think I think I'm probably more worried about the creation of diseases. I, I so I'm most... so I'm not sure that the nano factories would be. I think probably um, there are certain aspects of nano technology that definitely play into, are definitely relevant to the creation of uh, this the creation of these synthetic you know, designer pathogens but definitely i mean synthetic biology and biotechnology are are directly relevant to that and could enable people to manipulate genes in a in a way that uh, is truly unprecedented you, i mean you could create right. potentially so the, the one of the, there was another global challenges foundation report from i think from i think 2015 where they talked about the possibility of combining the um lethality of rabies, the incurability of Ebola, the long incubation period of HIV, and and the what, what's the other one? Oh, the contagiousness of the, the common cold. So there's no re you know, natural selection Good. kind of selects against hyper virulent uh, bugs because if you if you kill the host right. too fast, the, they become a dead end. You know, they're they're just a, a right. living coffin you get stuck in and you can't leap to to another body. So 
but, but you know, we don't, those constraints, those uh, um, evolutionary constraints simply don't apply to the malicious uh, creation of designer pathogens. So you could, you could potentially combine all of these horrific features and spread it around the world since it has a long incubation period. Nobody is symptomatic. Until suddenly, right. you know, in Japan, in South South America, and you know, right, right, right. Pe- people end up in the emergency room. Uh, yeah, so so biotechnology and things like biology are also uh, major major concerns. Kind of rapid fire uh, in terms of super intelligence. This has been discussed as a threat from uh, Elon Musk, Hawking, just to name a few people. Um, I'm wondering how how you think of the threat of super intelligence. And kind of my own nerdy kind of twist to it is there uh, is the difference between consciousness and intelligence relevant to a threat that a super intelligence might pose? Yeah, that's a great question. I I most definitely take the threat super seriously. Okay. All right, so Nick Bostrom argues, <clears throat> excuse me, in his 2014 book, uh, appropriately titled Super Intelligence that we should recognize the default outcome of a successfully created super intelligent machine to be doomed. And I think that's, that's absolutely mm-hmm. correct. It's it, the, so the issue here has nothing to do with Terminator, anything like that. Yeah. It's much, there's, <laughs> you, have, you should think about it as like it's beyond you, you Skynet. Know, yeah. 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 It's, it's much more of like a ghost in the machine that, that has general intellectual abilities that exceed that of the greatest attainable by, by our species. So, you know, so there, there are a couple issues here. One is, um, you know, we want to, we, so we want the, the superintelligence to be friendly, right? And friendly is just, is just defined basically as, uh, don't kill us. That it won't Please. kill us. Yeah. It won't destroy <laughs> yeah. us or create some kind of dystopic, uh, future. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the notion of friendliness in this context. So how do you do that? Well, you need to instill some value, some subhuman related values into it. First of all, there's a, a technical programming issue of how exactly you instill that. You imagine well-being is is the value is the moral value that uh, you wish it to, to, to that you you wish for it to, to to constrain its behavior in the world. So it turns out you know it's really hard to figure out how to get that into yeah. you know the programming language. Beyond that, there's a further question that relates to value complexity. That is, you know, I can I can ask my friend to go out to the grocery store, right, and and get a get you know a bottle of wine or something, and I'm not worried that that he or she is going to run over an old lady who's crossing the street, right? Because because there's just this background set of moral values or preferences or right. so, something of that sort that we share that enables me to specify particular goals and not have to worry about some you know some horrific event happening. So, you know, if you could imagine, like, if we instill just well-being um, in in a, a super intelligent machine, uh, if it pursues this goal without the proper background, the results could be catastrophic. So, if you say maximize human well-being, right. the really the best thing to do would be to destroy humanity first of all, because we suffer a lot, and the world is unpredictable. And you know, I could you know walk out today and and get hit by a car or whatever. So, you know, destroy humanity. Maybe upload some minds into a simulation, or create a farm of brains in a vat, where mm-hmm. they're in, they're in, sim, you know, you're stimulating <laughs> the right sort of nerve endings, such that these brains are experiencing extraordinary well-being all the time, constantly. So that, so <laughs> you know, then you have a situation that is, from a narrow perspective, is the morally best outcome. Right. Right. But but that's obviously catastrophic. I I, I don't want to be just a brain in yeah, a vat yeah, yeah. being prodded by some super intelligent AI. Yeah. So, so there... it's almost like when you ask a genie for a wish, and, and, and they give you some twisted version of the exact words of your wish. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So there are famous cases of like, yeah, of of the these sort of like perverse instantiations uh, that that sort of get at value complexity, like you know, make make humanity right. uh, eliminate all sadness. Well, you know, it does what the negative utilitarian would do; it destroys humanity and say, no, that's not what we want. We want to, you know, we want to to be happy. So then it, right. it implants electrodes in our facial musculature so that we all want yeah. you know and then it maybe implants some electrodes in the pleasure centers of our brain and we walk around as like you four zombies all, all day grinning it, it reminds me of yeah. like when someone says make america great again and then they elect a fascist as head of the united states kind of like right that. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about 
What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, we won't get into it. Um, all right. So, my, so, my, yeah, so there, uh, there's value complexity. And it's when you actually sort of zoom in on this issue, it's really, really hard to figure out the network of values that yeah. would enable a super intelligent machine that has more power over the physical world than we do and thinks maybe a million times faster just by virtue of the fact that you know electrical potentials in a computer go a lot faster than actual potentials in our brains um so so how do you figure this out it's it's really really difficult to to um specify all of the values and then you have to program it in there in addition there are other issues like um people talk about like imagine the, that the the value is just slightly misaligned with human values so there case, there's like a famous camp, case of the paperclip maximizer so it sounds like a super benign goal. You just say, look, this is what you do. You're generally intelligent, but, but you, know, you, you have this one value. Um, it seems arbitrary from our perspective, but frankly, there's, you know, if, if, you, if you look at us sideways on, we have all sorts of values that are totally weird, from religion to like, the yeah. urge to, to procreate. You know? <laughs> just like, you know, we just ha you know, want to do this. So you can imagine super television wants to maximize pa paper clips. And, and again, that sounds sort of benign until you realize that it looks around at the world and it realizes that paper clips are made out of atoms and so are humans. So it, you know, it demolishes us for the same reason that we, uh, with the same um, indifference that we, you know, uh, engage in ant genocide when we build a new, a new neighborhood or something. We just, it's just, yeah. they're just in our way. And they're sort of lesser creatures. Uh, so, you know, yeah. so, so there's there's a value alignment issue. It turns out that even slight mis, slightly misaligned values could have really catastrophic consequences. And the very last issue that's absolutely worth mentioning is the possibility of self improvement. Um, you know, so so this has been in the issue, in the literature for for many decades that you know creating a super intelligent machine is an intellectual task. So as soon as you have an AI that exceeds human uh, level intelligence, even just a little bit, it's going right. to be even just a little bit better than us at creating a smarter machine. Right. So then you have this this positive feedback effect, where you know the AI is like either looking internally and modifying its own code to make itself smarter, right. and again, it's probably thinking at a, a million times faster, meaning that from the outside, the human world looks essentially frozen. You know, I, I think I did the calculation. Yeah. I think it's like every every minute for us is two years for them something you know two years in subjective time uh, that that may be wrong but that gets at the the, the yeah. right idea um so yeah could, you could end up with an intelligence explosion uh through recursive self-improvement and uh and before we know it you know the difference between us and them is equivalent to the difference not between einstein and the village idiot but between einstein, between the average human and uh, a grasshopper you know, it's something like it just towers <laughs> above us in terms of its intellectual ability, and right. uh, so so that so that's why I think super intelligence is is um, I think initially it sounds fantastic, but when really when you look closely at these these issues, my own sense is there really is good reason for thinking that that as Elon Musk said something like we're summoning the demon, uh, yeah. use some kind of some kind of. Uh, you know, a florid language like that, but I, I yeah. think it's it's not it's not that far off. Yeah, I mean, he also said like best case scenario for a super intelligence is that we become like house cats, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I don't particularly like my house cat, much less <laughs> do I do I want to be someone else's house cat. Um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that uh, could, yeah, possibly that could be <laughs> one of the. It's gonna it's gonna appeal greatly to it's gonna appeal greatly to the furry community. I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, my next question, and maybe we just answered it, but like, uh, so I guess from our perspective, the uh, just based on the work we've done, um, for for me personally, I think I can speak for Casey here, maybe. But the the issue that keeps me up at night is climate change. That's the one that I'm most focused on, and like in terms of like the future and my grandchildren. If I can never convince someone to procreate with me, probably not. Let's be honest. But <laughs> but that's what I th that's what like keeps me up at night in terms of existential risk. So, uh, but I'm wondering from your perspective, like, is it super volcanoes, gray goo? From your perspective, what is what is the what what's the thing that, uh, so to speak, keeps you up at night? Well, to, to you know, there are things that keep me up at night, but weirdly, existential risk kind of don't. <laughs> Um, Trump most certainly has it's really the last... mundane things, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Trump, really mundane Trump things has the last week. 
yeah, yeah. I'm still recovering. Okay. Um, okay. Still yeah, paying, paying off my sleep debt. But, <laughs> um, but I think, uh, I mean, I think, I think that, frankly, I think that's due to various quirks of my psychology. Okay. That, that I'm not quite as disturbed as other people are about the really big, there's kind of a scope and sensitivity. I mean, we're talking about issues that are so big that I just, it's hard to get emotionally involved. Sure. I think, I yeah, think Trump I, being in yeah, office, yeah. it suddenly did affect me emotionally because it was, it was, thrust yeah. into the foreground that things like you know climate sure. change is going to is going to climate change policy is going to really suffer under yeah. him i mean there's every indication of that maybe it won't but there's every indication of, of that sure. being the case and the other thing about climate change i mentioned earlier that I, I think it's unlikely climate change would lead to would directly lead to um, a human extinction scenario or something of that sort because um you know, parts of the planet will probably be habitable. And my, my understanding, not being an expert in this field, but but being, you know, a well-educated dilettante, um, <laughs> you know, my, my understanding is that there are sort of uh, different states that are stable. And maybe we'll, we'll move to sure. the, the, the atmosphere will heat up a bit. We'll move to another state. And that state may be catastrophic. It may result in huge mass migrations and mm-hmm. the collapse of all sorts of civilizations and food, food supply disruptions, mega droughts, and so on and so on. Uh, further ecological collapse. We mentioned biodiversity loss uh, earlier, which is a huge issue that's super under discussed. Right. Um, but the thing, the the reason that that I think climate change is one of the biggest, the greatest issues right now, is because of its ability to modulate agential risk. And yeah. we mentioned before the instability, huh. the the connection between climate change and apocalyptic terrorism and things of that sort. Um, it's sometimes described as a conflict multiplier. And I, I think yeah. that's that's absolutely true. So I, I think climate change, the most worrisome thing about it for me is that it will increase the probability of conflicts involving other emerging technologies, a nuclear war <laughs> of some sort. Sure. Um, hmm. So I think it, it has all of these huge indirect effects. I mean, it's a context risk. It affects the whole context of, of human civilization hmm. on our, uh, our planetary spaceship. So... Yeah, that, that's that's what really bothers me about climate change. I just think it's gonna it's gonna, it, you know, it's it's sort of like the, the rising tide effect. It's just gonna make everything worse. Yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. And that's bad. Right. That's yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, so my my final question is that, uh, you you know, I get a sense a lot of the a lot of this seems very heavy to me. Like thinking about you know uh, the best and worst case of super intelligence or. Um, you know, eco-terrorism and climate change as a conflict multiplier. Would you describe yourself as being generally optimistic about the future? Or or, or, or do you find this to be as grim as it sounds? Um, that's a great c- closing question. <laughs> um, gosh, I really, I really struggle with... Yeah. I, I, so I, uh, just to be clear, I struggle with how, with how I would answer okay. this question. Because there's a sense in which... I do feel super pessimistic. There's a, so there's another sense in which the reason I decided to, the reason I, I got intru- really interested in this topic is not just my background with Christianity and whatnot, but it's that I think the good, the potential good aspects of future advanced technologies could be genuinely um, uh, wondrous and amazing. And, and you know, I think some of the ut- techno-utopian fantasies that people have are like, they're just not that implausible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we could get rid of aging and disease and colonize the galaxy and, you know, enhance our minds and, and upload our minds. And here he is going after, he's going after Zoltan now. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the, the, I don't think some, I mean, I think there are versions of, of these, these scenarios that are, are kind of crazy and, and uh, go off the rails a bit, <laughs> but I also think that th- there there are good arguments for, you know, the the ability for us to eliminate aging and live indefinitely long lives and stuff like that. Sure. So that's part of the reason I, I I really care about existential risks. I kind of see like just kind of peeking over the horizon something really desirable and worth working for. Uh, but but so that being said, I also feel, I, I to be candid, I feel pretty pessimistic. Um, I don't trust humanity. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think there's like there's like a segment of us that are a segment of humanity that is really bright and morally uh, morally thoughtful, 
and is is perhaps responsible enough to handle advanced technologies uh, and and to overcome climate change and biodiversity loss and things like that. And then there's this huge other portion that I, I think is you know is is consumed by these old you know the Paleolithic sort of modes of thinking. It's tribalistic. It's short term thinking. They, they struggle with 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 thinking about the global plight as opposed to just our local plight you could see this in, in, with respect to, right. to republican um representatives who say look it's snowing out therefore yeah. climate change is, Old Jim is Inhofe. false god damn it yep inhoff um who's the other i'm, I'm blanking on a few other names i mean there, there's some just incredible moments yeah well there's of like people a... yeah so so i i really don't i don't trust humanity as a whole to be smart and i also think that ai is is probably going to be a big a big risk even even if we manage to get through the trump era and and the catastrophic effects in terms of the, the catastrophic effects that i feel like you can reasonably expect in terms of global policy foreign policy uh mm. climate change and so on even if we get through i feel like there are other a few other hurdles that are quite significant like super ai and stuff like that and so yeah and, ultimately you know, I'm, I'm pessimistic yeah, frankly, <laughs> and I, I know it's something. It's something that I forgot to bring up earlier. Now that I, it's just popping into my head, but we've talked about agency and we've talked about um, different ways of that. But uh, one of the most interesting parts of uh, the paper I read about agential uh, risk that you wrote was about um, error. That maybe it's not even like someone wants to destroy the wor world. It's someone you know, you know, you know, one that you know how it is. You're just playing around with a some sort of a plague you designed in your garage, and then before you know it. But like it's I don't know like the error thing is what actually made me re like really like oh hell so it's not just about making society better and more altruistic because we're far more prone to error than I think we are prone to evil yeah. like I think the common person is far more prone to error than evil yeah there, there's a um what's it called uh I, I'm gonna get this wrong but it's something like Stenger's razor or something which which basically says that um you know you should always attribute to uh, foolishness or you know mistakes some some claim that otherwise appears to be malicious you know rather than a tr automatically right. attribute to malicious intent I, I would tend to yeah, agree yeah. yeah so i i think i think i think i think most people that, that seem evil are really they're either ignorant or crazy yeah well but um, and also just in terms of like good people i mean i, I make i make a lot more oh, errors okay. in my life sure. than there are a lot more instances of error in my life than there are instances in which i intentionally <laughs> went out of my way to to hurt another human being yeah. So you know, so you're mm. totally right that if, you know, if you can imagine, you can imagine a, a large population, um, even if there's a really low probability that any individual will will accidentally stumble and and press the uh, doomsday button, um, you know that probability could increase to pretty significant numbers. And so I so yeah, that is another reason I'm sort of pessimistic. Even in a, a perfectly compassionate you know world where it's just a bunch of peace loving tree hugging hippies. You know, who just want to want to, you know, want free love or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, you could still imagine if these technologies are widely accessible, perhaps a, you know, an error will will take us out. And there's so many cases of this historically of, of pathogens being leaked from, you know, a near near misses with nuclear incidents. Um, yeah, yeah, pathogens yeah. being. I, I think the 2009 swine flu outbreak was the result of a of a bug that was accidentally released. I think in a in a Russian laboratory in the 1970s uh, i wrote about it in, in my book but i so I, you know i think i have the details right there but sure so yeah error agential error is another big concern not just agential terror <laughs> and on that and on that note <laughs> i uh i think we're, we're gonna have to call it uh you know um again this has been uh phil torres talking to us today phil we appreciate you coming yeah that was and, uh, a great conversation helping to that raise was, the mood it was awesome i i no no i, I found it i found it very interesting yeah as well. absolutely yeah. and I, i'm sure we all share uh I, i'm sure we all share in, in varying amounts yeah. uh the the same sort of pessimism yeah and yeah, i'll be honest it, i plan i planned on drinking today anyway so i'm i don't, I don't yeah. mind you know sure, <laughs> sure. yeah and i should also add that sure. i could be wrong about my pessimism so, sure. you know, there are some people out there who are optimistic. So, yeah. so people shouldn't just, you know, uh, uh, feel too despondent after listening to this. No, not at all. Yeah. So feel free to pick and choose your reality <laughs> again, everybody. Um, it's all, uh, always, no. Uh, but, but uh, yeah. Adam, you have anything to add? Nope. I'll see you guys hey, next week. Or thanks next so time. much for having me on. All right, everybody. Pleasure.
Well, thank you very much, Phil. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll, we'll talk to you next week. All right. Take care.